After I finished with my own therapist, I decided I was going to take what I learned and use it on my brother, as well as、uh, two other people. I won't mention who they are. And I did two hours with my brother once, and that was a few weeks ago. We haven't been able to schedule another session. And he had been going to talk therapists for five years, and I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars he spent. And he's like, two hours talking with you about these issues that I know I've had felt. Far more valuable than five years with other people, just because they didn't touch on what you touched on. They didn't ask the questions you were asking. They didn't make me reflect on them in the way that you did. And I just think that's really testament to how powerful CBT is. Yeah, it's it's really it's such a great impact, and、uh, it's very interesting. I mean, what we focus on expands, and I think that you know, with different therapies where you're going over and over and over and over again, it can. Stimulate that victim persona, and where is that opportunity to break out of the story and flip the script? And I think when you have these powerful questions that causes the client to reflect and come to their own like reckoning, their own understanding of like you know. Part of it too is like you know this happened for me. This hap didn't happen against me or to me. All right, so this is going to be an interview with Casey Rossi about her psychology and how she runs her life and her business. If you haven't yet, we did an episode on burnout number fourteen, so I will have that、uh, available, a link for everyone to be able to watch. So thank you again、uh, for spending time with me, Casey. I really enjoyed our. First interview, and I'm excited to go a little bit deeper into your own psychology. I know we talked about burnout before, and so you you were very generous、uh, in talking about your psychology then, and、uh, hopefully we can touch on different aspects of it this time. So awesome, sounds good. Thanks for having me, Sean. For people who don't know who you are, why don't you just quickly、uh, tell them what your business is, and if you don't mind,、uh, how much you guys generate in revenue? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a business and leadership coach, and I've been doing this particular arm of my business since 2016, of six figures, and prior to that. I had a seven-plus figure manufacturing operation, so this is not my first time at the rodeo.、Uh, this is actually, I think, I'm on business eleven. So my primary function now is helping female entrepreneurs grow their business from the inside out. I have a method called the Soul Print Method that combines mindset and emotional intelligence to increase productivity, performance, and profits. All right, thank you for that.、Uh, What made you want to do this, especially if in the past you had other businesses that it sounds like were more profitable? Yeah, great question. So one was just the natural evolution of things, and two,、um, my seven plus figure business had employees. It was manufacturing. It was brick and mortar, and primarily we were、um, B two B and selling wholesale. So. Very different、um, processes and stress levels. So I think you'll remember that that's when I experienced burnout because it was just this push grind hustle, and I really wanted to change. And I also felt to be in integrity to who I wanted to serve. I actually had to embody what I was. Helping them to do, and so that's like I am so much more balanced and grounded in this particular、um, income bracket. Not to say that I don't believe that the sky is the limit, but I I do believe that there is a level of scaling and team that comes when you get to seven figures. That I'm very happy to have independent contractors and a VA every now and then at the six figure level. So what ended up happening with that business? I don't remember if we covered in the other episode. Did you sell it or did you shut it down or what? We sold it. We sold it in 2011. Was that a hard decision for you? It was interesting. I was ready to sell prior to my business partner, and I had a second company that I was doing alone at the time, which was an aromatherapy boutique company. So I had two things going along, and my Real heart was more into the holistic modalities of helping people and、um, providing products that healed, and I really felt like there was this misalignment because our manufacturing company, as fun as it was, and we were making people happy through chocolate,、um, I really felt like it was not the most healthy thing selling sugar, and so it was really feeling out of alignment to me as I started to like progress my own.、Um, Body and health and nutrition and everything, and I just was like, I really feel more aligned with 
essential oils and holistic healing than I do with, with promoting sugar. So I was ready um, prior to my business partner, Cher. I mean, if you asked her now all these years later, she'd be like, we should have kept that. So, um, but then we were just approached by a local couple that said, we've been watching you for years. We like what you're doing. Originally, they approached us to be partners. And then once they got in, they're like, we just want the whole thing. And so it just kind of progressed in that way. Have you, or at that time, did you think about getting rid of sugar from your product instead of selling the business? We actually did create a whole popcorn line that had nutraceuticals in it. This was far before the time where now it's been trendy, but we had popcorn for a purpose that we developed that had goji berries and maca and cacao and a lot of the superfoods in it. And we started promoting that. We were doing like um, a whole campaign with give back to good causes. But this is what I found. This was a huge lesson we had built from the ground up um, 10,000 wholesale customers and 3,000 retail customers, and they really liked what they liked. And it's all going back to knowing your ideal client avatar. So we had the success and momentum providing our current customer base exactly what they wanted. When we brought in the nutraceutical line, they were like, huh, where's Mega Mudslide? Where's Caramel Toffee Crunch? Like they really weren't all about it. And um, we just didn't see that traction. And what I found out was like, oh yeah, this would, this would be a whole separate arm that would have to be developed with the same care and marketing ingenuity that we used over here to get the success. Yeah, that would not have been fun to start a brand new arm when you're sitting there unable to see and having to sleep on the couch in the middle of the day. I don't <laughs> yes, think that would have been Yes, you remember that. Do. Yeah, I was getting visual burnouts, visual migraines from being burned out. Yeah, absolutely. And then what made you want to start this other company while you were still doing the manufacturing, even though you knew you were having this burnout? I was really looking for something to ignite that passion again. I was getting tired of doing a lot of the traveling. We were doing sometimes 26 weeks out of the year going from trade show to trade show with the manufacturing company. And there was this feeling like I'm a tourist. I really needed to get back to my body, back to nature, back to mother earth. And aromatherapy provided me that. And it gave me this sense of being grounded. I'm sure I was being healed by the plant medicine as much as I was creating it for other people to experience transformation. And so it was, it really was like this hobby. I had started studying aromatherapy back in the early nineties and I progressed that to the clinical level. So it was just always in my arsenal of self-care. And so it was just a natural progression to monetize and spread, spread that endeavor. You said plant medicine. So I have to ask. And if the answer is no, or you don't want to talk about it, totally fine. But I have to ask. Psychedelics are becoming more popular now. They were legal-ish in the past before Nixon decided they shouldn't be illegal. When you were talking about trying to heal yourself and you're talking about plant medicine, did you ever explore psilocybin, which is from uh, a strain of mushroom? No, I never did. And um, that's for a couple of reasons. So one is I have been on a meditation path. It's really like a big spiritual core of who I am since I was 18. And part of that philosophy is super consciousness and, you know, really connecting our soul to our oversoul. So a big part of my lifestyle, whether it has to do with my diet choices of not partaking in animal, I don't do drugs, I don't drink, and part of not doing psychedelics is really always being able to have that connection to my soul and not debase my consciousness in any way. Okay, fair enough. I, um, I've spoken with a few people who have tried psychedelics. One did uh, one microdose LSD, the other one uh, macrodosed psilocybin. And their experience was really interesting where they felt like the journey that they went on actually made them more connected to the universe and to their existence. I thought it was really cool. I haven't, uh, I haven't tried, I've microdosed myself, but I didn't do any macro dosing. Um, so that's yeah. why I thought it's, it's interesting. So I yeah, to I that. absolutely think there's no one right way. And I think that everyone is so unique and they have like their own experiences, their own layers, their own like cellular baggage, if you will. So it's just, it's a very unique experience, especially when it comes to 
spirituality or people looking for deep personal development. So it's, it's always a personal journey. So what makes you excited for the business that you're doing right now? I'm excited to have women step into their power to really use their voice unapologetically. And I think that now is the time. I mean, Sean, for me, I just feel like there are so many light leaders coming up. There are so many women that are like, you know what, we've been quiet for a long time, or we've heard a rumbling in our own soul and we need to do something with it like we need to have this manifested and it's no longer going to be enough to just journal about it so that part's really exciting for me is this kind of birth into self-realization and a passion to spread their message so um i think it's really coming from the individual level and spreading it outwards so i, I that's what i'm seeing and that's what that's what excites me did you ever regret starting this business? Did I ever regret it? I don't think so. I don't think I'm built for anything but entrepreneurship, honestly. <laughs> like, <laughs> I really don't. I've always said that like business is a part of our DNA. I almost feel like it would be playing a, back a record backwards if I was to like shift gears, but you never know. Like, again, I'm open to unlimited possibilities, but uh, I don't have regrets. I feel like everything has been a learning lesson. And even though like there's been struggle, like that's part of the human conditioning. It's brought me to where I am. And I just, there's always going to be like room for growth. So yeah, no regrets. Have you ever thought about stopping this business? Yeah. In the hard days, <laughs> I think most entrepreneurs, if they're honest, they're probably like, yeah, what the hell am I doing? You know, I think that it was one of the sharks that said like entrepreneurs are the only ones that will leave a 40 hour job so they can go and work 80. And I feel like sometimes that that's extremely true. Like I, I love what I do and it's taken some time to separate and to add boundaries because in my previous entrepreneurial experience, it was all business all of the time. And I think that that was what kind of burned me out. So in this current iteration, it's literally like, okay, where are the boundaries? When do I want to take off? Like it's much more fluid. So yeah, I guess to your question, on some of the days where it's like I'm slipping back into old patterns where it's like, you know, I can't get it out of my head or I'm just wanting to fall back into that grind mode. I'm like, wait a second, pause, mm. shift, get back into what you really want and why you created this. Yeah, sometimes I I do that. I'm in grind mode right now, but only because I I now have two companies. You know, for the last almost two years, I treated the podcast as a hobby. And in the last few months, I said, this isn't a hobby. This is its own business. This is an education company that just hasn't been created yet. And I need to do it because That's like awesome. you, I did that thing that made money, but I feel like I don't really have as much passion for that thing anymore. And I have passion for education. It's like, it's the first job I had as an adult was a teacher. So for me, turning turning We Live to Build into its own education company is something that I'm really passionate about doing. Oh, but yeah. I still have that other company. <laughs> so I'm like juggling. I've just hired two people in the last few weeks for We Live to Build, and I'm uh, about to onboard potentially a community manager. So now I've got two teams and two companies. I'm like trying to figure out how the hell to juggle that because something that people don't think about is like when you add an employee, you're actually adding more work because in the onboarding you for may sure have, <laughs> well, not just the onboarding but when you hire it's like i knew what my capacity was without any employees for we live to build and i would do what i could do and when i hired someone i said okay well their job is to do this thing that i can't do but now because i don't have an operations manager or a project manager i have to review everything they do because they're doing transcriptions and chapter titles and podcast clips uh, clip timestamps it's like i've got to review everything they do before it can go into action and then i've got a video editor and so he's working on video editing but then i need to review all the videos before they get published and guess what there's no one to publish them so i've got to schedule and publish and promote on all of the platforms so now all of the things that I was dreading doing and saying, I'm going to have employees to do that. Well, I'm now adding a lot more work to my own plate until I can afford to hire someone who can do those things for me. So sure. 
while it's exciting, it's also more tiring. Yeah, absolutely. There's always that stage, I think, when you're trying to get the foundational key members in place. And I think in my experience, Sean, what I have found is that like once all your SOPs are in and, and they're like getting your brand totally under wing and they're adopting it as their own and they know what your voice is and you can trust them, I think the review will be less. I don't think we ever have zero review because I think you're like me where we really have a high standard of production mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of perfectionist in us. I like to say that it's like a recovering perfectionist, but I don't know if it ever gets out of your system. But I think that we'll always have the final say in the final review because it's our name, our brand. But once you get that that like solid foundation, there'll be less of that um, double checking. Well, the, the only issue with the checking is that when, when we're checking a transcription or when I'm checking a transcription and the podcast clips, I'm limited by the player doing 2x. So I can only listen to the podcast at 2x. And if one of the guys does 10 episodes in a week, that's like, you know, six hours or seven hours of content that I have to listen to at 2x. So it's like three and a half plus four hours um, that I have to review all this stuff. And it's not perfectly at 2x. It's not perfectly two times, you know, uh, the uh, half the, the time. So it, it's quite a bit more work to do. But yeah, it's, I've learned to be less of a, of a perfectionist um, in that regard where when I was doing the audio, I would record or I, I would edit everything myself. So if it was an hour of content, I might cut 30 minutes. But now because I have the video editor, I'm letting him do the edits on the video and I'm just ripping the audio and I'm putting that on Acast and like letting the, the audience just hear it. It's like, I'm not putting the effort edits. into editing that anymore because otherwise I'd have to hire someone or um, I'd have to do it myself. And then the transcription doesn't match between the audio and the video and that's a mess and like it's yeah too much of a mess what has been your biggest fear to date biggest fear i think is not enough and i feel like funny enough that i tend to attract and i think this is is common but i tend to attract a client that has that same that same limiting belief so I would think that uh, it's been interesting. I mean, I think people come into our path for a very specific reason. And, and uh, but yeah, I would say that. So limiting beliefs are a really interesting topic. I want to talk about this for a second. So I've been learning about cognitive behavioral therapy for the last few months and learning how to employ it in my own life as well as how I can help others um, with their own issues. When you talk about limiting beliefs, what are some of the limiting beliefs that you see your clients have? Because I'm sure that people listening to this probably have the same ones. Yeah. It's so interesting how similar they are. We, When we're struggling, we always feel like it's our own individual personal struggle that no one's going to be able to understand us or get us. And then all of a sudden, that's the beauty of these kind of platforms because people are like, oh my gosh, I can completely self-identify that's me. That's what's been holding me back. So some of the big ones, I, like I said, the not enoughness is really at the root of it. I think a, there's a lot of talk and layers above it, but that core core underneath is not enough. And I think that that can really display itself in a lot of different things like fear of being seen and increasing visibility, doing Facebook lives, or even platforms like this, like a podcast, getting your voice out. I think there is that, am I smart enough? the imposter syndrome, it's been done before. Um, why would people listen to me? Maybe I need another certification before I can X, Y, Z. I think there's a lot of like, if this happens, then I can do that. I think we create these negative algorithms that hold us back. If I lose weight, then I can do this. You know, If I get this certification, then I'll do that. And I think that um, going to CBT, like you mentioned, there's such a powerful mindset cascade when we make the connection that our thoughts contribute to our feelings and emotion that contribute to our actions, which are a direct connection to our results. And I think when you lean into that and you really understand it, you can even break down scenarios. This scenario is the natural cascade when I have a negative or limiting belief and no wonder my result is lackluster or there's been no action. And then you can run it through that cascade again and be like, oh my gosh, wow, look how powerful my thoughts are. And they completely um, 
empower and inform the results. And the interesting thing about this loop of the mindset cascade is that our results will inform our thoughts again. So we literally have the power to break that cycle and to create kind of the, the happy generation versus the victim generation of poor me. Look, this, this is what happened. I knew it was going to happen and it did. And that really is the self-fulfilling prophecy of kind of going in the opposite direction of being in the creator mode. That's very powerful. And I, I love how you are aware of CBT. I don't know how big it is. Like I've, I've spent so many years outside of America. I discovered it when I was in America and I'm, I had a therapist I was working with for two months. Um, and that was really interesting for me because of what he shared with me. And I'm curious then, I know it's, it's a weird segue, kind of, kind of weird, but not what's something, you know, you need to change, but you haven't quite gotten there yet. I think sales has been something over the last two years that I feel like I know I need to do more prospecting and there's like a resistance. And I think it's because prior to that, I had a full client roster and I didn't have to do it. Like from the beginning, like I just, you know, came into it and had immediate work. And then through referrals, it was just more work. And then I had more work than I knew what to do with. And then COVID shifted a few things. I also shifted a few things in my business. And because of those couple of shifts, I never really implemented sales prospecting in the way that I think it deserves, like with actual time blocks in my calendar. Um, so I have really been more like go with the flow because the flow has always come to me. So that is one thing that I do know that I would have a more powerful um, book right now if prospecting was a part of my habit. Do you think there's part of you that might be neglecting this because you're afraid that you're going to need to hire an employee or two or three to help with the overflow? Like you had issues in the past when you were at seven figures. Are you afraid of burning out again because of that? There probably could be something like that. I think that's really good insight. We are programmed to go towards pleasure and away from pain. And so if there is like layers of, geez, I was burned out because we had between 12 and 25 employees, depending on our season. And so there may be a little bit of an association or connotation of like, in order to scale, I'm going to need to grow team and grow team equals burning out. So there could be a little bit of linkage there for sure. Well, I appreciate you being honest about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're not always honest with ourselves. And I think when we're not honest with ourselves, it's impossible to get through these things that we're talking about with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is really interesting because when you look at talk therapy, the goal is to get you to just talk. But with cognitive behavioral therapy, the goal is to get you to actually reflect in a way that forces you to go, well, actually, like, yeah, that it doesn't really make sense that I was thinking about it like that. So actually, yeah, it's I guess so I, was, I, I was wrong. I can't consider that. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that you brought that up. And I feel like that's one thing that I've seen as a reoccurring pattern, especially this month with the people that I've been connecting to. Many of them have had trauma or they've had abuse in their past. They've had extensive years of therapy and they really didn't see a lot of movement from that therapy, whether it was from sexual abuse, one woman who's agoraphobic, like there, there's so much suffering. And I think that like, there's this opening now where people are wanting to talk about it. And the interesting thing is when I look at, at their results from 16 years of therapy, six years of therapy, 25 years of therapy, and these are three individual ladies that have crossed my path in the past month. It's like, why did you continue to go to therapy when there really wasn't any type of transformation? And I asked them this, some of like one specifically was like, I never thought of that. I just kept doing it because that's what I did. And the other two were like, they were doctors. If it wasn't working, I just thought that they would tell me I should stop. And I think that's one reason that I absolutely love and am passionate about coaching because there's an action to it. There's not just digging in a groove of the same story over and over and over again. And I want to be clear, I'm not discounting therapy. I'm just saying that these three women crossed my path, both had, you know, all had extensive therapy, never felt really any type of transformation. It's like, wow, it was this light bulb that went off in my head. And I feel like when you look at the different modalities from counseling to therapy to coaching, 
I just feel like um, it's an interesting discovery when you start to look at all of the pieces. Yeah. So after I finished with my own therapist, I decided I was going to take what I learned and use it on my brother as well as uh, two other people. I won't, won't mention who they are. And I did two hours with my brother once, and that was a few weeks ago. We haven't been able to schedule another session. And he had been going to talk therapists for five years. And I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars he spent. And he's like, two hours talking with you about these issues that I know I've had felt far more valuable than five years with other people, just because they didn't touch on what you touched on. They didn't ask the questions you were asking. They didn't make me reflect on them in the way that you did. And I just think that's really an, a testament to how powerful CBT is. Yeah, it's it's really, it's such a great impact. And uh, it's very interesting. I mean, what we focus on expands. And I think that you know, with different therapies where you're going over and over and over and over again, it can stimulate that victim persona. And where is that opportunity to break out of the story and flip the script? And I think when you have these powerful questions that causes the client to reflect and come to their own like reckoning, their own understanding of like, you know, Part of it too is like, you know, this happened for me. This hap didn't happen against me or to me. And when they start to see things through that perspective, that's really where I feel like there's magical healing that can occur. And, and then you can start to get some momentum. What are some questions that you ask people that allow them to it's get so this? so individual. I mean, I think what I learned when I first started kind of seeing the difference, because that pivot in my business that I was sharing with you earlier, I was coming much more from a consultant standpoint and an implementer. And so when I was like, wait a second, again, I'm always checking in, is this alignment in alignment with like what I really want? And I started being like, well, part of a big piece of my deep why is empowerment. But if I'm the implementer and being the consultant, how is that empowering? And so that's when I really was like, okay, this is interesting. I'm calling myself a business coach, but in the early years, it was really business consulting that I was doing. And so when I started to like deepen my um, knowledge about it and my experience with it, I was like, okay, true coaching is empowering and it helps that person come to their own decision and uh, process it in a very different way. So what I learned, um, everybody's individual, but to answer your question, I would say that it took me a little bit to realize that I would dive in with how questions because it was very programmed from the consultant standpoint and very technical. And, and definitely it's a part of my personality to be a taskmaster for myself and probably for my clients. And so in that, many of my early on coaching questions went to the how. It was just like, how are we going to implement this? How are we going to fix it? And so I would say the most powerful questions are what questions versus how questions. Why do you think that is? What's that? Why do you think uh, why uh, what questions are more powerful than how questions? Because I feel what allows the person to go in the direction that their soul wants them to go. How is tactical. How they're thinking about the five-step process, the one, two, three, the bullet points on the to-do list. And that's not going to give them transformation. That is transactional coaching. So there's a huge distinction. So if you're in the business of transformation and empowering coaching, your what questions are going to like maybe be in a completely different direction than your mind was going. I think it also helps you not lead as an effective coach because you may be able to puzzle piece their situation together and be able to point out, hey, this is the gap. This is what I think you should do. But when you're open and curious and you allow the client to lead, these what questions open the door to where they want to go, where they want to travel, where they know that there's like a basement fear or a dark corner that's holding them back. So then would it make sense that why questions would come up first and then what questions and then how questions? I think it's not as linear. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far and I hope you're loving it. 
And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work and every week we bring you a new guest and a new story and what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now. For me, and this is how I've always run my life and my business, I can't stand boxes. I just can't. I, I'm not a label person or a box person. And I feel that when we try to be X, Y, Z, we X out the opportunity to listen to our own gut instinct. And the more and more I, I just turned 50 this year. And I think that the more I really ground into self-trust, to me, the most important thing is listening to our gut instinct and developing self-trust. So I would not want to lead your listeners astray to say why, what, how, you're good to go. Okay. I remember when I first started interviewing people, I wasn't terribly good at listening, or at least that's what my ex-wife would have me believe. And I started off with a lot of questions and I wanted to ask those questions and I struggled between getting those questions answered from the guests and listening to what they were actually saying. And what I learned to do as I did more interviews was stop having things prepared and just listen to what they're saying so that instead of making sure you check all the, the questions off the list, ask them questions based on what they've just said. And I think that's made me a much better listener in, as a human being. Yes. And I want to reflect back to you as a guest, there's absolutely a beautiful difference. So the work you're doing is working. Mm. And I feel that it makes a very effective interviewer, partner in a relationship, partner in business, because there is a difference when someone has an agenda and when they're compassionately and powerfully present with you. And I think for the listener, it's like a cool riff because in real life, we don't have a script, you yeah. know? And in fact, I, on the flip side, I was just on another podcast interview that was the opposite way. And she had six or eight questions, machine gun them and didn't really listen at all. It didn't matter. I could have said the cat is black. And then the question would be like, and how do you feel about the blah, blah, blah? Like it would have nothing to do with anything that I said. So there's a big difference, not only in relationship with who you're communicating to, but also for the listeners, it's so much more uh, like organic and people are going to lean in and get so much more out of it. Yeah. I, when I first started, I really wanted to have this thing where people would feel like they have they're like a fly on the wall and they get to listen to two entrepreneurs have a chat about something that they would probably never get a chance to hear about otherwise. Totally. So hopefully I'm succeeding there. Absolutely. What has been the hardest decision you've had to make so far? Hmm. I think that there are hard decisions um, on a regular. I don't feel like there's like specific ones. I feel like daily or weekly, we come up against these things of like, hmm, you know, like, let me just pause and think about it. But I would say like pivoting points would be to sell the business because that was definitely a pivot point. Um, I think another recent pivot point was shifting from consulting, implementing into coaching and leadership development. And so I think whenever we make a change, there is this like little bit of anxiety of like, am I making the right decision and all the other things that when we talk about that cascade that can just kind of like naturally unfold in that way. But, but I feel like, you know, life is not really easy and being an entrepreneur is absolutely not a cakewalk. And in that they're hard decisions on a regular. I don't think they're far and few between, at least they're not in my life. What made you go from being a consultant to a coach? And I'll, pref I'll, I'll, I guess before I let you answer, I'll say when I was a consultant, I could charge 10 to 20 times what I charge as a coach. But I felt like the people who I was charging didn't really care about what mm. I was saying, even though they were paying me a shit ton of money for that information and for that execution. So what about you? Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. 
I feel like the cons I always did like coaching consulting together, but it was more 80, 20 with 80 being the consulting piece from 2016 on. And so there is definitely more of an income generation because yeah, when you're doing billable hours, that definitely can add up and add to your bottom line. But I feel like repeat your one question. I want to make sure you uh, the beginning part cut off. So repeat that for me. What made you want to go from being a consultant to a coach? Yeah. So it really goes back to um, two things. One, the alignment piece when I was like, wait, I am so passionate about empowerment. Yet after I would finish a coaching session, I would end up with their to do list and they would be outsourcing their decisions and, and brain to me. And so really, when I started hearing my clients say, I thought about it and I thought, what would Casey do? I thought, I don't need rubber bracelets that are like WWKCD, right? I was like, I don't need that. So it was this light bulb moment. And I was like, okay, this is out of alignment to like really helping them like not be in the dark, um, you know, and it's, it's different from... I, you know, like there's two different things here. I'm going to go off on a little tangent because I think we can't do it all as entrepreneurs. And so like to your point of trying to get all the podcast editing in and this and that and the other thing, like I have fallen in that trap too, where it's like, no one's going to be able to do it as good as I can do it. I have these standards and let me do it all. And I think that's a surefire way to burn out. So I absolutely think we need people in our orbit to help things have like sustainable flow and to bring in extra income. However, I didn't really want to be that implementer. And I don't feel that when you hire someone, that means you're disempowered. So I just want to be super clear on that. The piece that I found is when your coach is also your consultant, that's going to be having the to-do list, there is this um, shift that happens, I think. And there's a reliability that happens from the client where they're like, I'm not sure. What do you think? You know, what, do whatever you think. I like what you do. And so there's that outsourcing, I think, of decision making and creativity. And they're just kind of like, you know, let me get on to my to-do list. And so there's a real, real difference. There isn't that space for those reflective questions that we talked about, that internal work, um, really thinking about the mindset or even their emotional intelligence. It was much more to-do list focused, and that wasn't lighting me up at all. The second part of why I switched from being a primary consultant into coaching is I really did not want to be humped over the computer for eight hours a day or more. And so it was really about like a logistics piece of I want to have this expansive freedom and not be like behind the thing doing web development and copywriting and building the funnels. I that really wasn't, you know, kind of bringing me joy anymore. Yeah, I don't like doing that stuff either. And yet I find myself doing it anyways, because it's for my own companies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how have you had to change yourself through this process of from your first company until now? Mm, great question. I would say that I had to learn to stand on my own two feet alone because my previous 10 companies were with a business partner and a business partner that was very dynamic and lovable and just had the whole personality piece dialed in, much more extroverted than me. And um, it was so easy being a part of a dynamic duo. There was tremendous synergy. There was a sense of protection. And it was like, you know, one plus one equals 10. And when I pivoted into my own company, it was like, oh, it's me, myself, and I. And now I'm like a solopreneur and I have to kind of like market myself and do all of the facets of the business. And that took a little bit. That took a little bit to kind of get grounded in my own sense of identity. That's interesting you went that direction because I've spoken with other people who generally started off alone. And then after a business or two said, I'm going to start having partners. And only after they started having partners, did they realize that they could have much more success. So I think mm, you're the first person that's been the opposite. That's, that's very common in my life. I tend to be the, <laughs> the one that's over there. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, the last time we spoke, you said that you have this best friend that you go on walks with and you meditate with all the time. Had you ever thought of doing a business with her or bringing her into the business you have now? Cher was actually the one that I had two decades of business experience with. So we've been best friends for 32 years and uh, we still see each other on a daily. And yes, yeah, so we've had extensive business uh 
partnerships and successes together. Okay, cool. I like that because you hadn't mentioned it last time. So I thought I would ask. Yeah. Yeah. What's the simple, most important change you've made in your, your current business in the, since you started something that really like supercharged growth or simplified your processes? something like that. Absolutely. What's coming to mind is the boundary setting. And I think that for me, that was massive because from all of my experience, you know, like we started that successful candy manufacturing company in our home. And this was again, back in the early nineties. And so we were so tethered 24 seven to the fax machine at that time and the beeps and the buzzes and the alerts and like never turning off. And I carried that whole paradigm with me in every single um, kind of client relationship where I would be answering emails at all hours. I'd be working seven days a week, even in the beginning part of my coaching business. And it was like, I was kind of addicted to that jump how high, you know, a little bit of like chemical, like, ooh, somebody needs me. It was like a dopamine hit, you know? And I feel that the biggest shift for me, and it was so simple, was like putting boundaries in. I really have like tried to stay to opening my inbox at 10 and three. It's not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot better than it was. And I have a pretty strong boundary. It's very rare that I'll do client work on the weekend. And that has, that has changed the way that my brain is wired. Um, the amount of time I spend on social media, I limit. So I think that this boundary piece has um, not only helped my business, but I know that it's helped my health. Yeah, that's really important. It's something that I don't know I would have learned if it weren't for my ex-wife getting mad at me about not having time for her because she used to come home at like 9 30 10 o'clock and like some of the people I would do recordings with or are people I had to talk to in in the states some of them in California so it was like nine out or was it it was like 15 hours difference between Vietnam or 14 hours so wow. if it was like 9 p.m for me it's like early morning for them and sometimes that was the only time I could really talk to them and so she would get mad and so she'd be like look you know like if I'm home at nine like it would be great if you could just be with me and so like, I was like, oh, fine. So I started like cutting the calls back to eight and then to seven and then to six. And then, oh no, I, I think I stopped taking calls on Sundays. And then I, I got rid of some calls in the evenings every night. And then I got rid of Saturdays and that was hard not having like work six days a week and being single again, I do, especially with the second company. Now I do work on Saturdays and I'll try to not work on Sunday, but that's hard. It's it's a it's a, a discussion with myself that sometimes I usually lose. Um, but one thing that I have insisted on continuing is uh, no calls after seven p.m. Good for you. Makes a huge difference. Yeah, especially because, like, I was supposed to have five calls today. Thankfully, the first podcast guest didn't show up, which was great. But like, I'm, imagine <laughs> you know you're. I want to say, Sean, you know you're overbooking when you're excited when someone cancels. Well, yeah, it was yeah, well because I was also supposed to do, or I, I did a, a pitch for an investor for my first company at eight fifteen, and then I was booked from eight fifteen to nine with him, and then I was supposed to do an interview from nine to ten thirty with the other guy because he wanted to do both interviews at once, and then I have you now, and then I'm supposed to have a mastermind in a few hours, and it's like. So yeah, I was very happy. Um, but I, I'm currently <laughs> overbooking. I'm currently booking two or three interviews a day right now because I'm leaving the spot that I'm in. And it's the first time in two months since I got to Europe that I have a quiet space to record. When I was in Spain, I had to pay a um, co-working space like every time I wanted to record. And it was like $15 an hour to record. And I had to do oh, two wow. hours at a time, but I wasn't recording for the whole two hours. So it was a huge waste of money. And in Greece and Slovenia, I didn't have any privacy for that whatsoever. So, so now's the first time. So like, I'm, I'm just trying to record everything I can because when I get, I'm going to Lisbon in a week. And when I get to Lisbon, I don't know if that's going to be a quiet space. I have no idea. So I'm afraid to make arrangements and I've got a friend coming to visit me from America for a week. So I want to spend time with her. So I'm trying not to book anything while she's here. So I'm just like, let me just get like 20 interviews out of the way, like in the first half of this month, like 
and just do it. Yeah, that'll feel good. It'll feel good when I have a week of no calls. That'll be <laughs> that'll be the best. So how do you handle distractions? Well, I think that um, we have to be disciplined. And one of the big things that um, working for myself for so many years is respecting it just as much as I was punching a clock. And it kind of goes back to our schedule, time blocking, um, and you know, just kind of not being willy nilly with our schedule. Um, having very dedicated pieces of social media. I personally keep my phone on mute. I silence all my notifications all day. Um, mm -hmm. I get, I, I, I'm proactive, you know, because otherwise the smarter the marketers are, the easier it is for our attention to be hijacked. And of course I'm not perfect. I have fallen into late night shopping on my phone in the bathtub, <laughs> but in the, in the regular, you know, um, confines of my work day, I definitely don't have like little windows and flags flying in, vying for my attention to look at the news or buy the latest gadget. So, um, and again, kind of just opening my inbox at dedicated times that has really, really helped and I'm, I'm huge at kind of doing the time block on my daily planner. Um, and I stay pretty close to that. And that really works for me because then when I leave at four, I'm done. And that's another thing that I never had before. I always kind of took my day with me. Like I just put my day in from like eight to four. I always take a two hour lunch where I usually meditate or walk or hang out with Cher. Um, today will be no different. And so yeah, I just, um, I, even though it can be boring for creatives, there is a beauty to slotting into a routine that works for you and it's repeatable. And then you don't give your monkey mind the opportunity to say, ooh, shiny object over here. Right. I mean, look, if you can work just a few hours a day and you can generate multiple six figures a year, I think that's most people's dream. Yeah. So screw it. Who cares? Go for you. You know, good for you. <laughs> Thank you. So when do you tackle the hardest thing you need to do each day? That is something that I have not mastered, but my <laughs> biggest thing is always trying to do that in the beginning of the day. Um, that, I mean, like years ago, I think they had like eat the frog first. Yeah, Somebody yeah. had written that book. Yeah. And when I do that, I feel so much better, but I, I, that is one thing that it's just like that it hasn't fully clicked in as a consistent piece, mm. but I have my best energy before noon. And so if I can have like a deep work block somewhere between that eight to noon slot, that would be the golden hour for me to tackle the hard thing. So then what is the first thing you do in the morning? I will generally put some type of marketing together. So whether it is the podcast or going and um, putting my posts out on social media, I will tend to do that. And I, I don't know if it's kind of like easing in the day when I'm having my drink or like, I'm not sure, but um, I know that that's not the most efficient way, but it's, it's more habit. And I, I really do feel that it, the chunkiest piece of tackling that, like the most important thing for me, I would say even not even eight to noon, I would say that that eight to 10 for me, that is when like, when I do that block, I'm, I'm like supercharged. So I just want to clarify, you said drink and some people might misconstrue that as being like an alcoholic drink. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, just... I drink, um, I drink mud water. So it's a combination of um, therapeutic mushrooms, different from the psychedelic mushrooms yeah. you were chatting about, but it's therapeutic mushrooms, masala chai, and turmeric. And I mix that with like a vanilla oat milk. And I absolutely love that drink that that I've been doing. Um, I got COVID 16 months ago and my taste and smell hasn't fully returned. And wow. so coffee was one of the things that I I uh, was not able to partake in and, and chocolate and a bunch of other things. But I had to find another morning beverage that, so I didn't feel like I was on a suffering trip and I found this mud water and it's, it's awesome. I drank mud water trying to get off of coffee because that's what they okay. um, advertised it for. And it didn't get me off coffee, but it tasted good. Yeah, it does taste good, especially with vanilla oat milk. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I usually would just drink it um, straight. I don't, I don't like to put okay. anything in, uh, in coffee, usually just black. Although it's good. Yeah. Cause you, you said the oat milk. Cause I, people think I'm crazy when I just say I want like black to like, you don't want milk in your drink. It's like, nah, I don't want milk. Well, my, <laughs> my, my real answer is I don't drink milk. So I don't want milk in my, my coffee, which is also for some reason makes me absolutely insane to like half the planet or more probably. <laughs> so what's the last thing you do at night? 
before going to sleep? Um, I generally meditate. I like to start my day meditating both when I wake up and when I go to bed. I feel like they're really good bookends for me. So you meditate three times during the day? I do. I met another guy recently who said he would meditate for like a few hours at a time in the middle of his day. Like I... I have so much energy burning inside me. Like I struggle to just like stop. And, and I mean, we, I think we talked about this before. I meditate every day for 30 minutes when I wake up, mm -hmm. but 20 minutes in, I fidget a little because I'm like, I, I know this is good for me and I appreciate meditation. Like I want to go, I want to move, you know, like I want to get started. Yeah. And uh, I just, I couldn't imagine doing it hours a day. So what has been your most expensive mistake? Oh, interesting. Um, I would say funny enough, years ago, I took out an ad in um, a popular magazine. Mm. And I just I had this like preconceived notion that like my business was going to blow up. And it was like a 10k ad. And that was the most that I had spent on a print ad. And this was again, years ago. So probably the digital marketing that 10k could have gone a lot further. Mm. I didn't get one call. I did not grow my email list from that ad like nothing happened. And I was like, so prepared. I was like gearing up like this is going to be amazing. And like literally is nothing. And it was just a teeny little, like maybe two by three ad on a page, um, for 10 K. So yeah, I, that one's coming to mind as like, Oh man. Yeah. That's crazy. I know my, yeah. my dad worked for a business before he, uh, he's a dentist. He worked for a practice and they would have a full page ad color and it's $80,000 a month. And they get clients from it, but it's because they're reliably there every month, month after month for years. Yes, absolutely. Even though they're like, they're funny because they, they're like, oh, how do we like, we, we've heard of this Instagram thing. How do we like get people to come to us through Instagram? I'm like, your average client is in their 70s. They don't use Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> such a good answer. Like if you really, really want to know, hire someone who's young, like half my age, hire an 18 year old. <laughs> you know, are you kidding? My, my 12 year old niece. I mean, she has a mastered, but the 18 year old would understand how to spend them ad money. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I am a huge believer of celebrating often, um, and not waiting for the wins to be these milestones. And funny enough with my clients, I feel like there's always a little bit of a resistance there. It's not something that we're programmed to do. And so, you know, when a client has a win and my question is, how are you celebrating? Like, oh, I never thought about it or, oh, and then they will fill in like a work item. I'm like, no, that's a work item. <laughs> that's not like a celebration. So um, I'm a huge fan of celebrating often and really programming our reticular activating system, our RAS to continue to look for things to celebrate because then we're going to find all these little micro wins that are just waiting to be noticed and experienced. For me, I love self-care. And so um, whether it's reflexology or acupuncture, like any of the things, like that's where I'm going to be, you know, putting my wins in. Um, not as often as the micro wins, but, you know, the micro wins could, could be like an extra little whatever I enjoy, like whether it's going to be um, an Epsom salt bath. I mean, it, these things don't have to be expensive, but on the bigger wins, I'm definitely, definitely doing self-care in a, in a bigger way. I'm surprised. I mean, I guess maybe because in America, massages are more expensive, but I'm used to like massages being a, a twice a month thing. It's not even a part of a win. It's just, I need this to stay sane. Yes. I love that. That's awesome. So then how do you handle losses? Uh, I think through reflection. Um, not sweeping it under the rug. I have always been a fan of debriefing. Even when I was doing implementation work for clients and we would do a launch, we would always debrief, not only the pluses, but like, how could we have done it better? I think, you know, I'm a fan of the Kaizen philosophy. So it's always about never ending improvement and looking at the supposed failures of what is the lesson here? What's the lesson in this fabric that I need to unfold, reflect at, and make sense of moving forward. So I think like reflection time is huge. Um, and I also feel like having a trusted confidant, which to me, like I said, has been share for, for all these decades to be my sounding board because there is that healing in a compassionate listener and they can give you perspective when you're too close to a loss and be like, okay, let's look at this. And, and I feel that that really helps. So, um, 
perspective, distance, and reflection. Okay. What are you currently learning? Oh my gosh. I'm always learning something, Sean. I mean, uh, it, it's like, what are you that's learning? the one thing. <laughs> what I'm currently learning, I'm learning about human design. That's my current thing. Um, I have a couple different things going on. I'm in a mastermind to amplify my intuition. I am in a nine month program that I'm wrapping up for advanced leadership coaching. So this uh, wraps in Florida, actually at the end of this month. Um, so I've got those two kind of professional learnings going on. And for a personal learning, um, I have hired a consultant in human design and I'm going into my chart and really seeing aspects of my personality that goes far deeper than just like astrology and numerology. It's, um, it's a pretty intricate system that's been, that's been very illuminating and I've just kind of cracked the surface of it. So how are you applying your knowledge of human design to yourself and your business? So interestingly enough, um, what I have found is I am a manifesting generator. So I have a lot of energy and um, can create a lot of things and I can have a lot of things going on. So that's been really helpful and in informative because it's like, oh, okay. You know, cause sometimes it can feel like popcorn brain because like, like, oh, here's a great idea. Oh, this is trademarkable. Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> So understanding like that's how I'm built is super interesting. The other two big pieces is um, I have like a fixer personality and a problem solver. And on the flip side, the continuous learner piece and the continuous learner piece. I was like, great, totally, totally there, able to embrace it. Yes. And the fix it piece, I'm still trying to see how that plays in because problem solver, fix it always finding the glitches in, in things and being able to dissect it. Well, that now that overlays on my consultant persona. So there's a little resistance of like, wait a second. So I haven't quite gotten there yet. It's um, something that is uh, fairly new and I'm still trying to see how these lenses overlay, but, um, but man, is it interesting. That's cool that you get to learn more about yourself. I think for me, I'm focused on, not just the CBT, but also uh, I joined a mastermind as well. And I'm trying to learn how to run a mastermind because that may be a nice. piece of the education company at a higher tier um, plan that I might offer. And I'm learning about uh, funnels when, you know, believe it or not, I don't know anything about funnels. Uh, learning about marketing and sales and paid ad and uh, paid ads and social media, things that I never did before that now suddenly, you know, I have to do because with my startup, I never had to do any of that. My team does all that stuff. Literally, like I was told, you know, just let us do this. You know, it's like you hired us to do this stuff. Let us do it. But now with this, I get to be the one that does it. I get to learn about it. And I think that's really cool. And I wish I wish I was uh, encouraged to learn that stuff with my other company, but whatever. I'm paying them to do it. And now I can't afford <laughs> to hire people to do to do it for this company. So I've got to learn now. Um, yeah. What's the most important thing you've learned? I would definitely say that self-trust and confidence are skills that can be built and should be just almost the elemental stage in your entrepreneurial development. Because once you have that foundation dialed in, it is so, so much easier. And it took me many years to realize that. So I would say for someone just starting out, um, invest in how you can really develop those two things, your gut instinct, your self-trust, and I'm going to, well, three and your, uh, and your, um, let's see, intuition, self-trust. What was my third one, Sean? I don't know. You didn't say it. <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> you only said two. I am listening, but there's, there wasn't a third one. Yeah. Self-trust and confidence. I'm teasing you. Uh, wasn't it intuition? That, that was the third one. Okay. Then Co self, self-trust, confidence, and intuition. Done. Yes, the trifecta. So would you say that's the advice you would have for entrepreneurs or is there anything else you'd like to add? I think that that is um, really, uh, with all joking aside, a big trifecta. And when you can lock that in, everything from decision making um, to the clients that you attract, I mean, it changes. It Everything changes. And so I would it, that would be the biggest advice, I would say, the starting point. All right, great. Well, I appreciate all of the the love and the knowledge you shared today. And uh, Thank you. we're going to end that here. Awesome. Thanks.